Ron Lieber, welcome to the show. It is great to be here. Thank you for having me. So you're the money columnist of the New York Times, and during your writing, I'm sure you've gotten a lot of questions from readers about different money topics, and I'm sure the people you've interviewed through the years have raised the same issues about money and kids. And it seems like teaching your kids about money is a, or can be a really touchy, sensitive topic for a lot of folks. Uh, why are parents so uncomfortable talking about money with their children? I think some of this is bred into us, right? It, if we grew up, uh, we people who are parents now grew up, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, whatever it is. Um, quite often, when we tried to ask questions about money, uh, we were met with some version of the following response, right? That young man is none of your business. And so we got used to the idea that there was something wrong with being curious about this. Um, Maybe it was because we were presumed not to know enough uh, to be able to handle the answers to the questions. Or maybe we were supposed to think that it was rude to ask about money or to talk about money or to even think about money. Maybe it was assumed that, uh, you know, if we asked and if we got the answers that we would blab and that would embarrass our families or embarrass our parents. And so for, you know, all of those reasons and more, uh, so many of us have talked ourselves into or been talked into assuming that this was a topic of conversation that was utterly off limits. Yeah, and what's interesting is we th- we think we're protecting our children when we don't talk about money, but in the end, the irony is by trying to protect them, we actually fragilize them in a way when it comes to personal finances. I think that's exactly right. I- I've actually heard it said to me and put to me directly in those terms. One of the very first times I was ever out, out in public talking about this topic, a dad raised his hand and said to me, you know, I, I just want to protect my kids from all of this money stuff just a little bit longer. Why is that not a good idea? And, you know, my response to him was, you have to think about, you know, what the end game is here, right? We're all in the adult making business here. And money is a big part of how the adult world works. When we don't have all that long uh, to make an impact or an imprint uh, on our kids' brains. And if you want to put this off until they're teenagers, the problem is, is that you then will only have a couple of years left to sort of get their head screwed on straight uh, until they are faced with a six-figure minimum decision about college, right? Well, nobody was really paying much attention. All of a sudden, these college decisions became enormous financially. And, you know, part, one of the many things we're getting them ready for is to make a a mature and appropriate decision along with us about, you know, what they're going to spend and how they're going to pay for it uh, to go to college. So, you know, if you haven't started that conversation, if you haven't started giving them practice with money until they're 13 or 15 or 17, you're not going to be able to teach them enough in time um, so that they'll be ready to contemplate those super big numbers when they're applying to college. Well, it's funny too, you talk about this in your book, The Opposite of Spoiled, is that while parents don't want to talk to their kids about money, they really, really, really don't want their kids to grow up to be spoiled little brats. My question is, what makes a spoiled child? Is it part of not, is it part of not talking about money is that an issue um, and also I'm curious what are the traits of an opposite of spoiled child sure you know it took me a long time to find the answer to that question because the word spoiled itself was something that came to me you know almost instinctively, right? The original thought exercise I was trying to go through was that, you know, try to figure out what all these parents who were confused about money had in common, you know, whether it was the people who had more than average or the people who had less than average, you know, what did they all want to accomplish or at least want to avoid? And so, you know, I asked myself what the single worst word might be that somebody would use to describe my daughter, now my older daughter, that would be the worst indictment of me as a parent, right? The thing that somebody might use to describe my kid that would make me feel like a failure. And right away, the first thing that popped in my head was the word spoiled. You know, it made the the hairs rise up on my arm. It gave me goosebumps, not in a good way. 
And as I tried to figure out why that was so um, instinctive, you know, I asked other people the same question, and you know, more than half of them said the word spoiled. You know, some of them did say racist, some of them did say mean, but spoiled was the one I heard most often. And I think the reason why that's the case is that you know, spoiled kids are not born; they are made. Spoiled is a verb, not just an adjective, right? Spoiled by whom? Well, probably spoiled by us. Uh, and so. It literally is an indictment of our parenting when somebody uses that word. So, yeah, I knew that that was what we were all trying to solve for. So, you know, I had to figure out what the the opposite of spoiled actually was. And you have to start by defining your terms, right? So, you know, I looked at a lot of what the, you know, um, academic researchers had, had found in this area. And, you know, they had attempted to come up with clinical definitions of spoiled and um, you know, the thing that was surprising to me about it is that money is really only a small part of it. Um, spoiled kids, you know, I think of four definitions, only one of which has anything to do with money. Um, spoiled kids have no rules, no standards that they have to abide by. So that's sort of number one. Number two is that if there are any rules, there are no consequences for breaking them. So, you know, the rules might as well not exist uh, in the first place because the kids feel emboldened to blow them off at will. Um, Number three um, is that uh, spoiled children are never allowed to fail. Their parent or parents are constantly kind of out in front of them, smoothing the path to make sure that um, they're not challenged or pushed too hard, or they're coming up behind them um, to clean up their messes. They are literally never allowed to fail, and if they fall over, their parents are there uh, to pick them up and dust them off and intervene with their teachers and their coaches um, and you know treat them like fragile little teacups. Um, and it's only with the fourth part of the definition of spoiled that you start to get into money. I mean, spoiled children believe that they have it all coming, and they are you know lavished with. Uh, goods or with privileges uh, way above and beyond uh, what most other kids get, and they are not grateful for them at all. They feel entitled. Um, Turns out that uh, while it's easier to spoil a child um, if you happen to be affluent in a family of means, uh, it's certainly not limited. I ran into all sorts of stories of families who were not doing very well at all financially, but the kids were nevertheless spoiled because their parents felt so badly about the situation that they were in that they lavished all of their limited resources on the kids because they did not want them to suffer. Um, this happened to with you know extended family, especially with extended family who were you know trying to do things for the kids as much as they possibly could, and the kids began to feel like they had it all coming. So those are the four ways in which I would define the term. So, you know, you have to start there before you begin figuring out what the opposite of spoiled adds up to. I guess even with those first three traits, they'll influence the personal finances in a way later on down the road, right? It is. Um, but, uh, you know, for kids who have no rules and have no boundaries, and if there are no consequences for breaking the rules, and if the kids are, you know, not allowed to run their own lives, um, you know, if those are the sort of standards you're setting or the baseline you're establishing, um, that means that, um, you know, there are no limits on what they can have or what they can spend, or if there are rules and they break them or they spend too much or they don't save up up uh, anything, um, that they're constantly bailed out or their parents feel like, well, this money stuff is all very complicated and stressful and I'm going to shield my child from all of that as much as I can because what's most important is that they're happy and well-adjusted and, you know, doing well in school and spending time thinking about that and certainly not working for money. And so uh, I'm just going to, you know, keep all of that away from them for as long as possible. Okay. That's what we don't want. What are the things we want to try to develop in our children so that they're the opposite of spoiled? Well, the challenge here, and it was one that I faced uh, directly, was that you know there isn't a great uh, antidote for spoiled in the English language. If you look in the thesaurus, the first thing you find is the word fresh. Um, but you know we're, we're not talking about meat or, or produce here. Um, you know we're talking about children. We're talking about the you know sort of the secondary definition of spoiled. So I found myself scribbling you know over months um, the list of the values and virtues and character traits that add up to the kinds of grounded, decent kids that we all want to push out into the world someday. Things like 
modesty and thrift and prudence, uh, patience and perseverance and grit, uh, certainly generosity and, and graciousness, a sense of gratitude um, for what you have, um, perspective on your place in the world and curiosity about how it came to be, you know, an understanding of your social class and who has more and who has less and how that came to pass and whether it's fair. Um, and so when you look at all of those things together on the sheet of paper, you know, if you use your imagination, you can immediately see how conversations about money and, you know, family practice and ritual around saving and spending and giving can actually lead directly to each and every one of those values and virtues. And so, you know, rather than uh, shutting down money conversations, if we actually do the inverse and embrace them, uh, those conversations can lead directly to all of these things that add up to the opposite of spoil. Yeah, that's a really interesting take because I think most people, particularly in our Judeo-Christian westernized world, think of money as sort of this evil thing that it can corrupt virtue. But what you're making the case that money can be a tool to teach important virtues that have bigger lifelong impact on our well-being and happiness and groundedness. Is that correct? Uh, Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you tip your cap to our sort of generalized um, uh, uh, kind of majority religious tradition in this country, because, you know, I, I went looking for the money is the root of all evil, the sort of source, the text for that. And I couldn't find it. I'm not actually sure it exists. And while there's certainly all sorts of parts of, you know, any and every um, holy book that you could find that, you know, sort of talk about the dangers of materialism, what I found as I researched the book, and especially after I wrote it, um, that the message was being embraced by people of all faith. I mean, I've been on uh, the um, uh, the debt free Muslims podcast. The book has been you know praised by all sorts of Mormons. Um, I've gotten great write ups on uh, progressive Christian blogs. Uh, you know I'm Jewish myself. People in the Jewish community totally got it, right? Um, and uh, you know all of these traditions. Uh, you know m- m- much of the, the the root of what they're trying to teach is you know how to be a good person, how to have good values, and because money is such an important part part of um, how we move through the world, it stands to reason that there is a connect, connection between you know, how we spend and how we save and certainly how we give and what we stand for as humans. So um, in, in fact, the, the connections are direct and they are deep. Um, and uh, you know, I've, I've spent more time than I expected to um, talking about them. All right, this is great. We've talked high level. What I love about your book is is that you, you do high level, and I love that, but then you get really brass tacks. Uh, you get down to the nitty gritty uh, and the questions that a lot of parents have about money and their children. So I guess the first question we can start off with is how do you start the conversation with your kids about money or, or when do you start them? Because, yeah, money is this really abstract concept. Um, you exchange pieces of paper or digital numbers out there in cyberspace and you get stuff. So how do you have that conversation with your children at different stages in their life? Well, quite often you don't even have to worry about starting the conversation yourself because kids are going to want things and it is going to be your job to not get them um, for them, uh, you know, the point at which, uh, you know, you're ready to start um, teaching them the difference between things that they need and things that they merely want. And so it can be hard to have um, that kind of conversation uh, with younger children, but uh, you, know, you should sort of be prepared for it. You know, for people who are listening who are just about to have kids or contemplating them at some point in the future, you know, you don't often get to decide when these conversations begin. And the, you know, the conversation, the questions will come fast and furious. Um, starting as early as the age of two, uh, I thought I had it tough at the age of three when my kid wanted to know why we didn't have a summer house. And it wasn't an accusation. She was just sort of curious, right? Um, But I was uh, speaking uh, several months ago, and a woman raised her hand and said, my two-year-old came to me the other day and wanted to know why it was that I went to work every day when a lot of the other mommies didn't go to work. 
what are you supposed to say to a two-year-old uh, about that, right? Um, and again, you know, you don't get to choose when these questions come up. And I'm not a big believer in blowing them off or even brushing them off. Um, you know, you want to get to the root of why the kid is asking and help them feel good about kind of who they are and where they are. So it turns out the mom of that um, two-year-old, uh, you know, we sort of drilled down on that. And I said, well, you know, why, why do you think she was asking? And she said, well, it's because, you know, when she goes on play dates, a lot of the time she's at, you know, houses where the moms are home. And I said, okay, well, where do you go during the day? And she said, well, I'm an attorney. And I said, okay, well, what kind of attorney are you? She said, I'm a prosecutor. And I said, oh, I said, that's easy. I said, you put the superhero cape on each each day and you go and you make the city safe. <laughs> and she said, oh, she said, so I should say that. I said, yes. And I said, you're a hero. Um, and that's what you go to do every day. So, uh, you know, it might be more complicated, um, you know, for somebody who is, a, 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 you know, an investment banker or, or, a, or a, um, a, 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 you know, a, 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 you know, na name your sort of, you know, high concept job, right? An accountant or, you know, something else that a, a, a child might have trouble really understanding. Um, but, um, you know, they are trying to make sense of how the world works when they ask these questions, and um, we're not really going to get to choose when they come, but it is our job to answer them, to answer them truthfully, and to answer them, uh, you know, at a level that uh, in some cases a two-year-old can understand. So you say in your book, oftentimes uh, they just ask these money questions. They're just curious. They're not being accusatory, even though it might come off as that. They're just sort of curious. They're just being kids. They're wanting to know. Right. And it's tempting to feel defensive because quite often they're they may be asking about something that they don't have that they want or something that other people get to do or they're sort of sizing you up and sizing their family up and trying to sort of place the family against some other family that might have a bigger house or get to do more things than your family does. And, you know, you'll feel a little bit like you're being judged. But more often than not, what they're really trying to figure out is, am I okay? How are we doing here? And if we're not like everybody else because we have less or because we have more, is that okay? And what am I supposed to say to people about that if they ask me about the fact that our house is bigger or smaller? And so, you know, your job as a parent is to you sort of think about what the best way is um, to explain, you know, where you are and, and why that is and to make them feel like it's okay because more often than not, it is okay. Yeah, that naturally leads to a great question. Uh, these issues of social class, it can be really sensitive and touchy. Uh, even when kids are really young, they start to get this sense. They're like, well, some people have more than me and some people have less than me. Uh, and it's become, I think, really more acute, especially for teenagers with social media, when you can see the rich kids of Instagram showing their lavish lifestyles off, where you have these YouTube channels where uh, I, where people just show off what they buy. I, I, don't, I don't get this. Like People just watch other people unbox things or see the stuff that they got at the store. Um, so how do you help your kids navigate this sensitive, touchy topic of social class? You know, how do you let them know, well, it's okay that some people have more than us, or if you happen to be wealthy, that sort of sensitivity um, about being envied and people scorning you because you have wealth. Any practical tips on dealing with that? Sure. So, I mean, let's, let's start with the first principle, which is um, don't lie. Um, the second principle is you should explain to your kids that we can't always know um, for sure how much other people have. You know, we may see um, physical evidence of it or know what they do, um, but we can't always be sure. Um, and the people who, you know, have a big house and a, a fancy boat and, you know, go on, you know, nice fishing and hunting trips all the time um, may be really far in debt and we just don't know it. And the people who live in a you know modest home without a pool and you know don't take fancy vacations or get in the car and you know drive and go to national parks, uh, they may be millionaires and um, they're using that money to you know fund things later, you know charity or college expenses or something like that. So um, you know there's a lot that we can't know uh, by looking at people. 
And then I, you know, I think the third principle is that, um, you know, we try not to judge other people's choices, um, but that we ought to explain our own. Um, and so, you know, quite often the question that will really rankle kids is like, well, you know, why did you decide to, uh, you know, be a teacher or a social worker uh, or, uh, you know, construction laborer or carpenter uh, when you could have been, you know, an oil field services executive or uh, a banker or um, run a startup and, you know, then we would have nicer vacations and a bigger house. Um, and, you know, it can be difficult to... Um, answer those questions if you feel some regret about, you know, where your life has taken you in terms of your career. Um, I'm not sure I would be completely honest with that, about that, you know, with six or eight or 10 year olds. Um, but one perfectly good response to that question is uh, I chose the career that would make me happiest because I knew that if I was happy and felt proud of the work that I was doing each day, that that would make me a good person and a good parent. Uh, because the most important job that I have is keeping track of you. Um, and if I'm not happy with um, what I'm doing uh, to make money, then I'm not going to do a very good job of being nice to you and giving you all the things that you need emotionally. Um, so. Um, that is not always going to be a satisfactory answer for a kid who feels like, um, you know, their nose is being rubbed in everybody else's affluence because you've decided to buy the cheapest house in the nicest suburb with the great schools because you wanted your kid to get a, a great education without thinking about what it would be like to be the only 16-year-old without a car, right? Um, but uh, our job is not to make them like the answers um, as much as we would like them to like the answers and to like us. Um, our job is to tell them the truth and to explain uh, our decisions so they can learn how to make decisions themselves. So again, you're using money to explain values and virtues. Exactly, right? And um, you know, for better or for worse, and I, I would hope for better, um, many of us have made decisions about um, what sort of careers to pursue, um, not because uh, we wanted to maximize our income in any way we possibly could, uh, but because we wanted to do good in the world or feel good about what we were doing uh, or have more time as opposed to less time um, to spend uh, with our families. And those are totally defensible choices, and we need not be defensive in explaining them. Okay, that's great. Great advice. Let's go to the next question that you tackle in your book. It's the question that I think causes so much acrimony amongst in mommy blogs, parent blogs, discussions on Facebook, it's about allowance. Because I wrote an article using research and resources you look to in your book about when to start paying your kid allowance and how to pay them allowance, how much, and it caused a lot of intense debate. People are really, really passionate about this topic. Uh, so let's go there. Should you even pay your child an allowance? And if so, do you connect it to chores or not to chores? There's probably some other questions I have too along the way. But let's start there. Sure. Well, I think the most important thing to do is to step back and ask yourself, you know, why, why allowance in the first place? What is the point of the exercise? Um, and, you know, I would encourage people to think about it like this. Um, money, when you're talking about kids, is for practice. It's like books. It's like musical instruments. It's like art supplies. These are things that we want them um, to get good at. And um, in that way, um, you know, allowance uh, allows uh, kids to practice being good at money. It's not compensation for work done. There will be plenty of opportunities to send them off into the world as teenagers and let them get practice, um, you know, earning money. Um, I don't think we should treat it like a wage and set up our households to be um, – uh, you know, little mini enterprises or whatever. Um, money is something um, <clears throat> that we want kids to practice and get good at. Chores are something that they should do for free because they live in the household and everybody's expected to contribute to the household. Um, I would certainly not reward kids for biological functions, for brushing their teeth, for keeping um, things clean, for, for hygienic goals, right? Um, if nothing else, uh, you want to avoid pain for chores um, for a practical reason, uh, which is that 
the moment you start doing that, you know, the smarter older kids start scheming and planning for a point when they will have enough money saved up uh, that they'll be able to come to you and say, I've got enough money for the next three months now, and I am not going to do any more chores until I need more money. And that's a perfectly fair response because you were the one who set up the wage system and packed yourself into that corner. So rather than ending up in that situation, uh, I would just as soon um, keep the chores and the allowances separate from one another in the first place. At what age should you start doing this? As soon as they're cognizant of buying things or how much things cost and what's, when's a good time to do that? Yeah, I think pretty much the moment um, they start asking for things that you don't necessarily want to buy them and that you want them to think about a little harder and not just, you know, try and um, acquire impulsively, um, you know, as long as they're at the point where they understand that money is not an art project. I mean, I've heard about, you know, three and four and even five-year-olds taking paper money and ripping it up and, you know, so pasting it and gluing it places. <laughs> so you want to make sure that they have that, they've been able to make that mental leap um, or, uh, you know, a natural time that start it is the first time the tooth fairy that shows up at your house. So that may well end up being the first time um, your kid ever has money that belongs to them. And, you know, as soon as they have some of it, they're going to want more of it because no matter how much the tooth fairy brings for that first tooth, uh, it probably won't be enough to buy a lot of the things that uh, the kids will want. And, and then they will, you know, be looking for more money to, to reach their goals. And, and that's probably the moment that you start, um, that you start, uh, you know, handing it over to them regularly in the form of an allowance. Yeah, we started paying my son an allowance when he was four. Uh, And it's been interesting to see his progression because when he first got it, he had a hard time holding off buying things he really, really wanted, like a cool Lego set or something like that. And he just wanted to buy the stuff that just cost a dollar, like a, you know, pack of stickers or a candy bar. And it'd be funny to see him have buyer's remorse when he got home. He's like, I don't have enough money for my Lego set. And I was like, well, then you, you made a choice. You have to live with the consequences. Um, but now he's gotten a little more savvy about holding off and delaying gratification and saving up his money. Um, yeah, I mean, we want them to make mistakes and to feel regret. Um, you know, this is part of the process. And the more practice you have with mistakes and regret, I think the less likely you are. Uh, to make those kinds of mistakes in your 20s and 30s when it starts to matter more because you'll have this memory, memories, a whole memory bank uh, filled with uh, mistakes that you made. And, you know, hopefully um, as you make them, you sort of rewire your brain uh, to think about money a little differently. So related to allowance a bit, it's about spending money. So I, I think this could be a challenge for some parents. You know, there's some parents out there who, when their kid wants something, they can honestly say, tell them, well, we can't afford that, right? And so the, the question, the problem solved, right? Parents, not in the budget, so they can't buy that thing. But there are parents out there who they have enough money or the kid has enough money to buy really fancy things, luxury items, really expensive things. But at the same time, as a parent, even though you could afford it, you still want to set limits for your children. So how do you manage that? How do you tell your child no, not because you can't, not because you can't afford it, but because you just shouldn't for some value-based reason? Sure. So, you know, these aren't always easy conversations to have um, because sometimes they can feel a little random. So you want to do whatever you can to make sure that um, they are not random, right? So you start first and foremost kind of with kind of like a top line list of banned items of things that are not allowed in your household. And, you know, you make those lists, right? And maybe it's violent video games or actual weapons. Maybe it's clothing that, you know, bears the midriff or skirts that are too short, or um, maybe you've become so overwhelmed by um, the number of Legos or dolls in your house that you simply cannot abide by a single additional one passing the the threshold of your home, right? Whatever it is, make that list, make it clear uh, to the kids and sort of start there, right? Um, And then, you know, when it comes to allowance and, you know, setting the amounts of allowance, uh, you want to give the kids just enough money so that they can buy some of what they want or save up for it, um, but not so much that they don't have to make a lot of really hard choices. So rather than... um, having the parents be the deciders all of the time. Um, As soon as possible, I think you want to get to the point where 
uh, you know, the kids are making the decisions. And, you know, some parents as early as seven or eight or nine, they'll say to their kids, okay, you know, we've been at this allowance thing for a couple of years now. So from this point forward, anytime you want something, if it's not your birthday or the holidays, um, you're going to have to buy it yourself, right? And then it, it's all on the kid, um, you know, to make the decision and to sort of, you know, do self-limits. Now, when it comes to things that kids need, there's obviously like a whole con- continuum of, you know, what you might spend in any given category. So, you know, I encourage parents to, to sit down and, and, and literally put the continuum to paper, right? So if you think about, I mean, let's think about like underwear and outerwear, right? Um, many parents, most actually, I think, you know, probably no matter how much money they have, they don't see any real good reason to spend a lot of money on kids' underwear, Right. I mean, they they're going to outgrow them and, you know, they're going to get all ratty and whatever. You know, it doesn't make any sense. It's not something that the family prioritizes. And so, um, you know, maybe your family is an old Navy or a Walmart underwear family, uh, because why should you spend more than, you know, two dollars for a pair of briefs? Um, But on the outerwear side, uh, maybe your family goes fishing and hunting all of the time or maybe your family likes to ski or maybe your family are bunch of hikers, right? And if the gear is not really, really good, everybody's going to be miserable. And so when it comes to outerwear, um, you're actually going to spend a lot of money. You know, you're an Orvis family or a Patagonia family or an REI family. You're really willing to spend on that gear. Um, and so you set your budgets and your spending accordingly. Now, at a certain point, at, you know, 9, 10, or 11, you may be ready to turn the entire annual budget for needs over to your kid. And you'll say, okay, you know, you're only going to get, uh, you know, 20 bucks for 10 pairs of uh, underwear this year, uh, you know, or 10 pairs of bottoms if you're a girl. Um, but for out of outerwear, we're willing to set aside, uh, you know, $150 for, uh, you know, your coat for the, the coldest season of the year or for your raincoat, right? And then you hand that over in a lump sum and allow them to make their own decisions. You've explained what you stand for, but, uh, you know, if your teenage daughter, uh, you know, wants to buy Victoria's Secret bras and that's not on your banned item list, she should go to it. But, you know, she's only got 20 bucks left for her coat. She's still going to have to buy that because that's part of the stuff that was on your need list. And, you know, at that point, she's going to be shopping at Goodwill. And, you know, if the Victoria's Secret bras are more important to her than the coat, uh, she's not worried about, you know, being miserable when you go out hunting or, or skiing. Well, you know, um, then that's on her. So let them fail with their choices sometimes. Yeah, let them fail, let them make decisions, and let them be in charge of um, the limits, right? I mean, you're setting overarching limits by letting them know, you know, what the budget is for needs and and, um, and by setting their allowance. Um, but, um, you know, on a day-to-day basis, if they feel like they're the ones making the decisions and they're the ones with the power, you'll have fewer conversations and upset moments about, um, you know, what it is that's available to them. Another aspect that I think a kid being spoiled that a lot of parents associate with is that they're greedy. They don't share. They're not generous. Are there things we can do as parents to nudge our children to be generous, not just with money, but with their time as well, so that they're, they're just generous adults when they head out into the real world? Sure. So, I mean, I think it starts with having a you know, one of the jars where they store allowance being a gift jar so that you're establishing both with like a visible, visible, visual cue and, you know, sort of the weekly dumping of money into that jar and then the occasional, um, you know, handing out of said money to a worthy cause that, you know, this is something you expect them to do and to think about all the time. Um, but even so, some families um, find that uh, their kids find the whole giving conversation to be somewhat abstract. Um, you know, maybe you live in an area where there are not a lot of um, obvious visual signs of people being in need. Uh, maybe you restrict your kids, you know, media consumption such that, you know, they don't see a lot of sort of haunting pictures or videos of people who are in trouble, and so it can be a little abstract. In that instance, and and really in every instance, I encourage families to talk about their own history of having been helped themselves because, you know, almost every family has one and, and quite often it affects the way that they give. So, you know, for me, my wife is from a family of Holocaust survivors and, you know, I got financial aid, I got scholarship money from, you know, sixth grade all the way through college. And, you know, my mother 
had premenopausal breast cancer when I was eight or nine, uh, you know, back in the day when that killed people more often than not. But, you know, she was treated at a really great uh, university uh, teaching hospital where there were a lot of research funds available and super smart uh, clinicians, and they saved her life. Uh, and so, you know, those stories and, you know, we tell all sorts of stories about all three of those kind of major impactful um, occasions in our family's history. Um, you know, those stories are really meaningful to kids. It helps them um, really have a kind of a visceral sense of, you know, where their roots lie and where the struggles have been and who and all of the entities and individuals who have reached out a hand to help. Um, and those stories, um, they stick with kids. Uh, it's part of how kids learn. And, you know, once they uh, kind of adopt those stories as, the, as their own, um, I think they understand almost intrinsically why it's important to help other people. Fantastic. Well, Ron, there's a lot more we could dig into, but I'm going to let you go now. Uh, where can people learn more about your book and your work? Sure. So my uh, personal homepage is um, oppositeofspoiled.com. Um, and that's, you know, where sort of the basic outlines of all of this is. But, you know, for people who want to participate in an ongoing conversation um, about these issues, as different ones and nuances come up, um, my Facebook page is uh, where I'm particularly active. It's facebook.com slash Ron Lieber author. And, uh, you know, several times a week, we've got new stuff up there that we're sort of chewing over in the community. It's uh, about 8,000 people now who follow along. Um, and, you know, I'm going to have much more to say uh, about these topics uh, going forward and, you know, definite lines of reporting that I'm pursuing both at my day job and what I think will be uh, another book someday. So I encourage anybody who's interested to come and hit the like button and follow along. Awesome. Well, Ron Lieber, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. It was my pleasure. Thank you. My guest is Ron Lieber. He's the author of the book, The Opposite of Spoiled, Raising Kids Who Are Grounded, Generous, and Smart About Money. Uh, you can find that on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Also, be sure to check out the show notes for this podcast at aom.is slash Lieber. That's spelled L-I-E-B-E-R. Uh, you can find uh, the highlights as well as resources we mentioned in the podcast as well. Um, so go there.